All right. So we started last week talking about walking through these titles, saying that we need to make Jesus our king. And I challenge you to make Jesus the king of your life by seeking his kingdom instead of our own, by following his commands, his rules, and, and ultimately by living as citizens of heaven. You know, in, in one of the songs we just, Christmas songs we just sang this morning, it talked about, sing ye citizens of heaven above. Who is that? That's us. Right? I think we get this idea that he's talking about angels. No, we're the citizens of heaven when, we're, when Jesus is our king and we submit to his kingship and, and are part of his kingdom instead of ours. Amen. But like I said last week, this is a lot easier said than done. It's easy to teach it on Sunday. It's easy to hear it on Sunday. It's harder to live that out every single day. In fact, you may have had a struggle with that this week. And I told you that the disciples before Jesus entered Jerusalem, were wrestling with this very idea. They wanted to make Jesus king of their kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And you would think after his death and resurrection, they would have had things straightened out in their mind, wouldn't you? They did not. Listen to how hard this is, Acts 1.6. So this is after Jesus' resurrection. He spent quite a bit of time with the disciples. This is right before his ascension. And once when he was eating with them, uh, I'm sorry, I got to back forward. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, here's the question, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? What are they still asking Jesus? Is it time now? Now will you do what we want? And what's Jesus' answer? He actually doesn't say no. What he says is, look, only the Father has the authority. Only the Father knows when anything is going to happen. Here's what I want you to do. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Stop worrying about the when and start doing the what. He says, I want you, you will be my witnesses. And you'll receive power from me when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, when we're part of God's kingdom, we need to be about God's message, his kingdom message. Amen? Now, this is hard, and and I'd love to have good news for you in telling you that the message today is easier, but that would be a lie. And I try not to lie on Sunday. (laughs) So, I try. Sometimes I miss it, all right? Luke 2.11 is our key verse for this entire series. This is the 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 angels talking to the shepherds. On the day, the night when Jesus was born, they said, For unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And and we've talked about King, and now you get Savior and Christ and Lord. And we're going to dive into all of those titles, but we're going to take them in reverse order. Jake kind of gave you a little spoiler. What are we talking about? Jesus has... Lord. Now, Christians have a complicated relationship with this word. Now, what I mean by that is, you hear all the time, if you ever watch a sporting event and there's a Christian in that sporting event, they talk about Jesus the Lord. Thank the Lord, right? Christians use that term all the time. We use that title for Jesus. He is our Lord. Amen? Amen. Anyone feel weird about thinking about Jesus as Lord? Yeah, no, it, it's kind of, con- in fact, it's almost cliche. We've kind of lost, what does that really mean? It just becomes a name, and we don't think about what it means for us to call Jesus Lord. But the other problem is, so we've got this, on the one hand, we use it a lot, but on the other hand, we don't have a real cultural or collective context for having a Lord. In fact, if you take it out of the Christian circle, when you think of a Lord, what do you think of? What imagery comes to mind? Yeah, a king, maybe something like this, right? Kind of medieval times, right. and the, the knight is bowing before the Lord, and a king, right? A king is, is the Lord over everything, and, and then he has lords under him who are given property that they are in charge and they're responsible for. They're responsible for the land, they're responsible for the people on that land, and the Lord gives fealty to the king, and all the people in the Lord's region give fealty to that Lord, and also to the king, right? 
But here's the problem with this imagery. Uh, and first of all, how many of you love medieval times, right? Swords, crossbows, all that is just awesome, right? Hey, you get a movie on that, I'm there. I, I, I'm right, whether King Arthur, it, it, you know, Game of Thrones. Well, not Game of Thrones, because that's it's a good book, but don't watch the movies or the shows, right? Yeah, all of this imagery, you get this fantasy uh, in, in this time, and it's very, it, 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 it has this feel about it. There's something about it that just, and maybe it's just, cause, maybe it's just us men because we're more visceral. I don't know. It, you know, we just want to see things chopped up, <laughs> something like that. That's why they, we become chefs or something. I don't know. Um, here, here's the issue. With, yeah, I got lost there for a second. Here's the issue with this imagery. This comes about a thousand years after Jesus. So what the Bible times are talking about, when, when the Bible authors are talking about Jesus as Lord, they don't have this in their, in, in their image bank, right? Th- this is far away. But the, on, on the other hand, it's not all that far off either. So let's, let's talk about scripture and when it talks about this term Lord, what it means. The Greek word is kairios. Say it with me, kairios. Now kairios very simply means master, ruler, or Lord. But there's where we kind of get into trouble. Just like last week, right? We don't want a king. We don't want, if we don't want a king, then we certainly don't want a Lord. Right? We don't want someone telling us what... Here's the more modern version, and you'll all get it just like this, right? The more modern version is boss. How many of you got work tomorrow? How many of you are looking forward to a conversation with your boss? How many of you dream of the day when you don't have a boss? Yeah, how many of you wish you had a good boss? Don't raise your hand. It might be on video and we don't want your boss to see, okay? Yeah, right? I, I, I wrestled with that in corporate world especially. I wrestled with uh, going in every... And sometimes I had a good boss and sometimes I had a bad boss. And when I had a good boss, life was good. And when I had a bad boss, I was miserable. Right? We don't want someone telling us what to do, looking over our shoulder, and we can do their job better than they can do it, Right? You know who gets, who gets promoted in corporate world is the people who can't really do the job. And they just keep going further and further up. I mean, the dumber you are, the higher you go up in the, in the infant, right? Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm getting in trouble. I have a pre- previous boss of mine is going to come find me, right? Here's the, here's the bottom line. We just don't like having a boss. We don't like someone telling us what to do. In fact, our modern philosophy, if we're really honest is echoed in a poem. Pastor, you're going to talk about a poem? Yes, I am. By William Ernest Henley. And he wrote this in 1875. It's a poem called Invictus. And the last two lines of this poem, you may recognize. He said, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I think this encapsulates what much of our culture thinks about having a boss. I don't have a boss. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Now, Nelson Mandela said this, he paraphrased this, and he said, I am the master of my destiny. Would you agree that that's kind of the thought process in our culture? You ever go to a bookstore and look at the self-help section? (laughs) What does the self-help section tell us? You can do it. You got it. You got this. If you'll just work harder, think better, be better, do things, you, I, I've heard, I was watching television yesterday, and I think I heard this phrase four times in four different shows, you do you, you do you, man, you do you, you're the master of your fate, you are the captain of your soul, it's all up to you, well, let me ask you a question, this is great in theory, how well is it working in practice in our culture? There's where we get into trouble, right? If you put this into, like the young people say, IRL. Was that woke? I said that just for my son. He hates it when I say the word woke. Apparently, I'm too old for that. All right, here's what I want to do. I want to look at a couple of examples, specifically two men in our culture that really lived this out to the T, okay? Okay. And the first, and we, I just want to talk about how did it work for them. They lived out this philosophy. 
And the first guy is a guy you might recognize. Anyone recognize this guy? Who is this? Anthony Bourdain. Now, Anthony Bourdain had the dream job. Anthony Bourdain traveled the world eating food. It can't get any better than that. People are paying you to travel around the world to eat food so you don't have to. Where do I sign up for that deal? This guy had everything. He had the dream job. He had the dream life. He had what many would consider the perfect life. He had the perfect job. He, he, he was a chef, a world-renowned chef. He was an accomplished author and a TV personality. He had success and fame and financial security. Anthony Bourdain was in full control of his life. He was the master of his fate and the captain of his own soul. Until in 2018, while on vacation in France, he hung himself. So how was it working in real life? It wasn't. All right, let me give you another guy many of you will recognize. Who's this? Robin Williams. Probably one of the funniest men who ever lived. I've laughed harder at Robin Williams, and I've also thought, that dude is insane. There is some, some disconnect, some rewiring happened in his brain at some point. The dude was funny, and everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. He was a stand-up comic, a well-accomplished stand-up comic. He was a TV personality. He got Emmy uh, uh, nominations. Anyone remember Mork and Mindy? Yeah. Right? That is like the quintessential 80s sitcom. Hilarious. Stupid, but hilarious. But he, and you would think, okay, he's a stand-up comic. He's doing something like Mork and Mindy. Come on. The guy's life is over after that, right? Nope. He went on to make some of the best movies that have ever been made. Movies like Hit Mrs. Doubtfire, right? Hits and misses, okay? I was thinking more like Dead Poets Society, Goodwill Hunting, those kinds, right? Oscar nominations. Again, he had it all. He had money. He had fame. He had success. He was in full control of his life. He was the master of his own destiny. Until in 2014, when he hung himself in his home in California. What are these idiots thinking? Yeah. Do you hear? What are these idiots thinking? That's a great question. How is that possible? Here's the problem. Here's what's wrong. Both of these men had everything that we imagine that we need in this life, right? right? But it doesn't work. This philosophy of I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul sounds great in theory. It is terrible in reality. Because when, here's what we do when we're given control of something. I don't know about you. Every time I'm given control of something, I blow it. <laughs> Even when I think I've got it under control. This, I don't know if you know this, but my daughter's about to have my first grandchild, and I could be a little bit excited about it, just a little. By the way, this time next year, there's going to be so many gifts for this child under our Christmas tree, it's going to be ridiculous. We're just going to deal with it, all right? But I, I made a crib for little Charlie, my own hands, every little piece of it. And I, all right, I'm going to put this thing together. And I'm in control. I've been working on this thing for a couple of months. I get to the house and I spent three hours trying to put one bolt into this stupid crib. <laughs> and I wish I could say I was exaggerating. Jake, where's Jake? Was I exa am I exaggerating? Three hours and a trip to Ace Hardware. <laughs> By the way, I love Ace Hardware. <laughs> you walk into that place and say, I need one of these. And they say, how many? And in what color? And they take you right to the bin. Oh, it's a great place. I, I, okay, I'll get off on that. Here, here's my point about the whole crib thing. I built that thing. I knew how. This isn't Ikea. And I spent three hours trying to put one bolt together. When we're given control, what do we inevitably do? We blow it. We end up, at, at best, exhausted and weary when we try and figure out life. Anyone ever felt exhausted or weary? That's at best. At worst, we feel depressed and suicidal. See, money doesn't solve the problem. Success doesn't solve the problem. 
Having more control and more power does not solve the problem. And this, is, this shouldn't be news to us. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. Two giants in Scripture, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, talked about this very thing. The first guy is a, is a guy you may recognize uh, by the name of King Solomon. What did King Solomon have? Literally everything. Right? He, asked God, he, he has this, this great epiphany moment. God asks, he said, you're about to be king. Ask me for anything and I will give it to you. And, and Solomon doesn't even hesitate. He says, I want wisdom to rule your people well. And God says, man, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm going to give you wisdom and money and fame and power. I'm giving it all to you because you asked for wisdom. And Solomon lived his life with everything he could ever hope for. And listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun and really, it is all meaningless. In fact, that's how he starts out the whole book. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And this from the guy who had everything. He had money that you couldn't even begin to imagine. He makes Jeff Bezos look like a pauper. He had fame the world over. Kings and queens were coming to him to ask for advice. They were bribing him with more wealth. He had hundreds and hundreds of wives. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> he had everything we could ask for. And he says at the end of the day, it's all meaningless. So we go to the New Testament. I'm sure the news gets better there, right? Well, here's what Paul had to say in Romans chapter 7. He says, I've discovered this principle in my life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. We just spent a month talking about that. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Anyone ever felt that? That's exactly what Anthony and Robin felt at, at, at a point in their, many points in their lives. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who's going to free me? Now, sometimes when we think we're in control and we are the masters of our own fate and we are the captains of our own soul and life just continues to fall apart, it really leaves us at the end of the day with one choice. End it all. If I'm in control and I keep blowing it, there's not much else I have control over, is there? I'm going to tell you there is a different way. That is never the solution. It's never the right answer. Ever. And by the way, if you ever get to that spot, pick up a phone and call me. I don't care what I'm doing. I don't care what I'm doing. If you get to that spot of desperation... Pick up a phone and call me. Come on. Okay? Right. But can I answer this question? Paul answers it. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? He says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 I'm glad you applauded because I'm going to make it harder. <laughs> you see, we look at this and we say, yeah, Jesus is the answer, right? Jesus is always the answer. Any trivia game I get in, I don't know the answer. I just say Jesus. He's always the answer. <laughs> I dare you to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but he doesn't say just Jesus. He says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Is that just a cliche that he's sticking on the end there? Is that just something that Christians say? We're just supposed to call him Lord, so I'll tag it on to the end? Does it have some meaning? This word Lord means a lot. It is used over 700 times in the New Testament. 400 of those specifically in reference to Jesus as Lord. So I want to give you, I gave you the bad examples, right? Anthony and Robin, people in charge of their own destiny. Can I give you the flip side? 
two examples of people who, who didn't live by that philosophy. They lived by a totally different philosophy. They lived by a lordship philosophy. And they happened to come right out of the Christmas story. Grab your Bibles. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 1. Starting in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, you think? Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Very practical question. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. But here's the turning point. Here's the point I want you to pay attention to. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Did you hear what Mary said? Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Now that'd be easy if everything that the angel had said about her was some grand glorious plan. Mary, you're going to have fame and fortune and people are going to follow you on Instagram You'll have 2 million Insta followers. And your life is going to, you'll have no troubles whatsoever. But is that what the angel had told her? No, the angel told her, you're going to be a single mom who has a baby out of wedlock. At least that's what everyone's going to think. And oh, by the way, you're just going to give birth to the savior of the world. No pressure. Was this anywhere in Mary's plan? Those of you who are, were at one point in your life were ever planning to get married, how would you have felt with this kind of disruption? Right? You had a plan. You knew how your life was going. And God comes along and says, I'd like to throw a small little wrench into it. I'm going to turn your world upside down. Mary could have said, this is, this is not my plan. But what does Mary say instead? Not what I want, what you want. She says, I am the Lord's servant. Whatever you say, I'll do. Man, that's a mature attitude. And it didn't stop with her. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Because, you know, she had to go tell her soon-to-be husband this whole news. Talk about a change of plans. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born, Matthew says. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she'll give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Did you, re did you hear that? He did when he woke up. He did what the Lord, the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. He broke all the rules. Why did he break all the rules? Because he did what God wanted him to do. 
See, Mary and Joseph are in this difficult position. They're in an impossible situation. And what I want to challenge you to do today is exactly what both Mary and Joseph did when God interrupted their lives and changed everything. I guarantee you from that moment on, Mary and Joseph's lives were never as they expected them to be. But thank goodness they were obedient to the Lord. Because it's why we're here. And it's why we get to celebrate at Christmas this miraculous gift that is given to us. Because Mary and Joseph served the Lord God instead of their own interests. Mary and Joseph said, I am not the master of my own fate. I am not the captain of my own soul. The Lord in heaven is. They followed a different way. And I want to challenge you today to make Jesus your Lord. As always, this begs a question. What's the question? How do I do this? How do we make him Lord? And I'm so glad you asked. Because scripture tells us how. But I want to warn you. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to make you very uncomfortable. I'm going to put you way outside your comfort zone. Okay? Philippians chapter 2. Oh, that's no big deal. You probably heard this passage before. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Paul writes, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. No pressure. Just the exact same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, bless you, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. You read through this list of what Jesus did. And I think we read this and we miss how big it is. Jesus gave up. He did not think equality with God was something to grasp, even though he was God. He gave up his divine privileges. And those were big privileges. Like eternal life. Like never having to die. Like never having to suffer. Like never having to smell. All of that. He gave it all up. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And we think, big deal. Me too. Except he was God. The God of the universe who created it all came on Christmas as a human being. Not just any human being, a baby in a borrowed manger in the middle of nowhere. No fanfare. And he did it on purpose for you and for me. And he wants us to have that same kind of humility. And then he dies a criminal's death on a cross for you and for me. He says, but God elevated him. But listen to what happens next. Are you ready? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to read that again. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Two steps we're to make here. The first is every knee should bow. Now, I think, we're, and by the way, this is where you're going to get uncomfortable. Because when he says this, I think we have, we, we have one of two thoughts. One is, yeah, someday, someday every knee will bow. Someday Jesus will make every one of us bow our knee to him. Or the other thought is, well, he's just, this is, just think about it. This is theory. This is not real, right? Hang on. The second thing he says is, every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord. Bow the knee, declare that he is Lord. Let's look at those in a little more detail in reverse order. Declare Jesus is Lord of your life. Have you made this declaration? Yes. Now this word declare, by the way, is a verbal thing. 
And it's backed up in Romans 10.9. Romans 10.9 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? But it is an open public declaration of your faith that Jesus is Lord. That's why when we do baptisms, I do a baptism class all, every time I do it. Do I have to say something? The answer is yes. You have to verbally declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the good news is if you do that, if you believe in your heart and you openly declare, you are saved. Right. And that doesn't get you excited. Nothing I'm going to say after this. This is as good as it gets. You just say Jesus is Lord. And you believe it in your heart. You are saved. Right. That's fantastic news. But the second thing is, is you bend your knee to Jesus as Lord. I don't know. See, again, the results here are very powerful. And this is literal. This is not metaphorical. This is a literal bending of your knee to Jesus as Lord. And the results are powerful. Listen to this. If you bend your knee, you're free. And I didn't say that. Paul did, or the Psalm says it. We do this together. Paul said it in Romans 7. How do, I, how do I get free from this life of sin and death? Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And this is something we're supposed to do together. Psalm 95 says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And there are times I think we see that. We, we sang a song this morning that talked about bowing before our Lord, kneeling before him. You know what did not happen in this room? We didn't do it. We sing it, but we didn't do it. But we're going to fix that. So you all notice the worship team moving around. I've asked them to come up. And this is where it's going to get uncomfortable. Because guess what we're going to do? We're going to together declare that Jesus is Lord. In fact, let's do a little practice. Say it with me. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Let's make it even more personal. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, Jesus is my Lord. Lord. That's the easy part. I want you all to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to give two separate invitations this morning. Number one, if you have never declared Jesus as Lord of your life, if you've always thought you were the one in control, and that that was the way to go, I want to invite you to come forward this morning. Step out from where you are. Excuse me. Come before us this morning. Come before God this morning. Kneel before him. And declare that he is the Lord of your life. Give that control. Surrender that control to him. For everyone else in the room, while we're singing, I'm going to ask you to kneel before God. Now, if you physically can't do that, then sit before him. Okay, I, I get sometimes you can't. You, if I do it, I won't get back up. Okay. I don't want to be calling the medics later, okay? But if you can do that, if you can't, just sit where you are. If you can, I want you to kneel before God while we're singing. And I want you just to declare him as Lord this morning. He said, Pastor, that's, that's uncomfortable. I know. Surrender is not easy. Surrender is not about making us comfortable. Surrender is hard. Surrender is saying, and hey, maybe there's a part of your life. I've done this before. I do this all the time. God, you can have everything but this place. That's not how it works. He wants it all. Jesus wants all of it. So just bow before him. Kneel before him. And then at the very end of this song, we are going to together declare him as Lord. But again, if you've never made that step, I want you to do one more thing and step out so that we can pray with you this morning. So that you can know that God is in control of your life, not you. Let me pray for us. Father, this morning, we come before you. We right now enter into the throne room of heaven to submit to you, to kneel before the Lord our God, to declare that you are my Lord. And Father, I declare to you this morning, you're my Lord. I give you everything. I give you my family give you my finances, give you my job, my heart, my thoughts, my mind. I submit it all to you this morning. 
Father, we surrender everything to you. If there's anyone in this room, Father, this morning who's never made that public declaration, who's never taken that step and knelt before you and declared that you are Lord of their life and received and believed, I pray that you'll give them courage to do that this morning as we sing. And may we all bow before you and surrender our hearts and our lives to you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing and bow before you this morning.